So from this, you see why we are interested in studying this uh, many body function, because if we can compute it, uh, we have a function whose force uh, are the photoemission energies and minus one excitation for the additional energies and plus one of uh, our system. Now, this is nice, but the, the tricky part is that this uh, many body grid function is still defined as the expectation value on the many body ground state. So up to this point, uh, I mean, I have a quantity, which is nice, but uh, all the difficulty is still there. And uh, so to, to overcome this issue, uh, suppose that I have uh, my many body system with, uh, say, one body part of the Hamiltonian and uh, an interaction. Then there is a theorem, it's called the uh, Gelman L theorem, which allows me to rewrite uh, this uh, many body group function as another expectation value, this time on the ground state uh, of the free particles of the non interacting particles. And the price I pay is that this time the expectation value is over uh, my initial two fields operator, plus uh, there is this uh, operator for the many body interaction. And this enters into a sum with uh, n terms. So the n equals zero term will be just the expectation value of this two field operator, which is the uh, free particles in function. And this is easy to compute. It has a very simple expression. It has the free particles wave function, wave functions, and then it has poles uh, at the eigenvalues uh, of my independent particle of the that is the small edition. And then all the rest, which, are, which comes with the sum of uh, this term with n bigger than zero, can be formally, let's say, included in, inside the, the self-energy, which is called the self-energy. And this is the part uh, of uh, many body perturbation theory, which is uh, somehow the counterpart uh, of what is uh, the exchange correlation potential of uh, GFT. Now, there is, of course, a big difference. Well, of course, there is a big difference compared to VXC that uh, this uh, self-energy has an exact definition, so it can be expressed uh, through this way. And in particular, if I truncate the sum, I can add uh, up to a finite order the, the effects of many body interaction. Now, one important uh, remark is that this uh, self-energy is, uh, is doing uh, a huge job. So it enters, uh, let's say it couples through this uh, uh, independent particle green function via a Dyson-like equation. And the big job which it does uh, is to change the poles uh, of my independent particle green function to the poles of the interacting system. And the other difference is that this uh, is an uninteracting quantity and has, uh, let's say, a fixed number of poles. While instead, the many body grid function has uh, many more poles. And the reason is precisely because uh, the self energy is frequency dependent. So if you compare these two expressions, they are formally pretty similar. Uh, here we have uh, uh, independent particle wave functions. Here you have these uh, Lehman amplitudes. Here we have these uh, eigenvalues of my one body Hamiltonian. Here I have this object, which I defined uh, as different of total energies, but they are very similar. But the key difference is that the number of poles of these objects in general is much bigger. Then the, the way many body perturbation theory is implemented is uh, to start, let's say, taking, uh, uh, in a way, most of the effects of the, the wave functions of the self-energy into account by defining what is, uh, let's say, the quasi-particle approximation. So the idea is uh, to solve uh, this Dyson equation with the self-energy at fixed point, the quasi-particle energies, in such a way that I can compute something which has the number of poles. So the fact that these two objects have the same number of poles is trivial if I take here a static self-energy. It is not so trivial if I take a dynamical self-energy evaluator evaluated at the quasi-particle peak. So it is true if I assume that there is, uh, for every independent particle peak, a well-defined uh, dominant quasi-particle peak, and then I can define, associate with uh, a defined energy. So in this case, the, I can define a quasi-particle self-energy, which has a very simple form, similarly to the independent particle self-energy. And then from there, 
what remains uh, are these, uh, let's say, dyna dynamical effect, uh, effects. Uh, and the idea, the picture is that uh, I can capture most of the physics with the quasi particles. And then what is left uh, are uh, what are, can be called the weakly interacting uh, quasi particles. Uh, and then I can hope that this is uh, weak and I can just give corrections on top of that. So let me stress a bit the differences uh, compared to, in between DFT and many body perturbation theory. So first of all, uh, in DFT, we have an auxiliary system of non-interacting particles, uh, and this is meant to get the total energy and uh, the density of the system. When instead, uh, within many body perturbation theory, I have this picture of uh, weakly interacting quasi-particles, which can be made exact. I will comment a bit more about that. But in particular, the theory has uh, the exact excitations of the interacting particles. And of course, the price you pay is uh, one that uh, here you have something which is no local in space, which is uh, something which is, uh, let's say, not good in a way, and something which is frequency dependent. Now, since this is, uh, let's say, very demanding, in practice, it's not feasible to directly solve uh, uh, many body green functions. And the idea is that to, is, uh, what is coded in practice is many body green function on top of density functional theory. So what is the initial many body perturbation theory is a combination of density functional theory. And that is many body perturbation theory. The idea is that one starts from one DFT calculation, can compute the Konecham uh, green function, so the independent particle green function this time comes from Konecham. And so in this picture, one replaces its uh, T3 particles with the Konecham particles. There is just uh, this term which needs to be removed from the, let's say, quasi particle self energy and the correction to, to the Dyson equation. But then the, the idea remains the same. So before going into the details, uh, just a sketch on uh, how it works in practice. Uh, this is the bus structure of uh, hexagonal boron nitride without commenting much on which kind of many body perturbation theory calculation is. Here I want to stress the idea that one computes the DFT bands in black. Then you get uh, this correction from the, the difference between the self energy and the exchange correlation potential. Uh, but then if I take, let's say, this uh, cut in uh, energy space at fixed K point, uh, one of the, let's say, plus of uh, many body perturbation theory is that uh, compared to Konecham, where I just have uh, a well-defined peak, uh, this time this uh, energy point uh, can be thought as uh, a quasi-particle peak with the line width uh, and eventually with satellites. Now, where is, it, where is the width uh, and the satellite coming from? It's coming from uh, the frequency dependence uh, of the self-energy. And indeed, uh, I can think that, for example, my quasi-particle peak uh, results as uh, many poles in my many body green functions, precisely because uh, I have a frequency dependence of energy. So there is also an alternative view, which is uh, based on the idea of doing the what is called analytic continuation of the self energy. So up to now, the self energy was a function of the real frequency. What I can do is do analytic continuation uh, in the complex plane uh, and then solve uh, this, uh, let's say, uh, quasi particle like equation with this dynamical self energy. This is all exact. I get a set of uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and I can define a complex green function. So please notice that this is not Hermitian, and this is why I have left and right uh, uh, eigenvectors. And then this green function coupled with uh, this condition gives uh, an alternative, uh, let's say, exact representation of the many body green function. Why did this is convenient, at least conceptually, because in this case, I replace uh, what is on the real axis is uh, a set of many, many poles, with a simple pole which comes from uh, the solution of this equation, which has this time uh, a, a finite line width, uh, which is the imaginary part of the self energy evaluated at the quasi-particle point. So I have to say that the, the mathematics behind this analytic continuation is uh, rather subtle, and it is discussed uh, in details, for example, in uh, these two papers. 
And uh, one of the reasons is that when I do the analytic continuation, I have to go through branch cuts, which are these uh, poles. And then uh, I have to deal with the multi functions. So in practice, numerically, what we do, we stay on this side, but we take advantage of this picture because we can compute the, the lifetime of the quasi-particle peak in, uh, via the imaginary part of the solid energy. So let me just add an example, which I took from uh, this uh, review of modern physics to, let's say, give uh, a better feeling of this concept. Imagine you have to have uh, this green function, which has uh, a sum of poles, which uh, they have energy S, and the residual, which is again, a function of the pole, which has this form, this form which is basically a relation. Now, what can be shown uh, analytically if, uh, is that if I take this equation and I, I go in the, the limit of the continuum, so this sum becomes an integral, the integral with uh, this uh, one over omega minus s times this function can be done analytically. And uh, doing the integral, I obtain exactly this expression. So I obtain, uh, let me extend my omega now becomes z, and I obtain uh, an expression which is as this form. So this self-energy, which has many poles and exactly this representation in the continuum, exactly becomes uh, a green function with one single pole, which is now uh, in a complex pole. Okay, let's say that this was pretty much about uh, the theory, uh, the main concept about the many-body perturbation theory. And I, I would like to, to show you how this is uh, implemented in practice in the GW self energy, and then uh, to give you some examples. So first of all, the GW scheme comes from the Eigen equation. So where I have the, my Dyson equation for the green function coupled to the self energy and the self energy can be expressed exactly through a set of function that is screened the electron electron interaction W and the vertex gamma. And the screen electron electron interaction is the bare interaction times a uh, polarizability. And this vertex gamma is uh, somehow, let's say, something described, uh, well, not, I would say, not very clear physically, something which is uh, difficult to handle also because there is this functional derivative. And indeed, what is usually done is to simplify this vertex, we take it to zero, and then it simplifies uh, significantly the polarizability and then the self energy, and we obtain what is called GW. Then what we what we call in practice is often this uh, G naught W naught, which means we take uh, just for the polarizability the green the Konechian green function G naught G naught, and we plug it back uh, in the equation for the screening. So if we do that, we, we get this uh, GW scheme, the, the screen interaction has two contributions, one from the bare interaction, which is the exchange self energy, and the other one from the screen interaction, which is uh, the correlation. So one thing I want to stress, these are, um, let's say, scaling test of uh, CPU time versus, okay, in this case, number of GPU cards on this GW calculation done with this Yambo code. And here, the remarkable thing is that most of the time uh, is taken by the computation of this chi naught. So this uh, the first of these three equations, which is the simplest one. It looks like the simplest one is the one that in many situations is taking most of the time. And indeed, one of the keys uh, for, uh, let's say, GW and many body perturbation theory is that uh, one is able to proper model the electron-electron interaction and the, the screen electron-electron interaction. Okay, after we have the self energy, then we have to solve the Dyson equation, and uh, the Dyson equation can be rewritten exactly in this form. And uh, the last approximation, which is usually done in the implementation, is that we assume uh, that the quasi particle, uh, let's say, amplitudes can be well approximated by the condition ones. So, in doing this, uh, we just need uh, the expectation value of the self energy. So, we are just taking the diagonal elements. And then the quasi-particle energy comes uh, as a correction uh, to the condition states. And in particular, for the frequency dependency, what one usually does uh, is to, to do what is called the Newton method. Let's say that uh, I take this self-energy and I expand it around uh, the condition energy. 
And then uh, this equation becomes uh, this one, where there is this prefactor coming from the expansion, the Taylor expansion to the of the Konechan energy. And with all this, uh, in the end of the picture is that I take my Konechan peak, as I've seen shown at the beginning, and there is a shift in energy, there is a width, the imaginary part, and then uh, I also have this Z, which gives me the integral of uh, the area below this peak. So it gives uh, an idea of uh, how much, uh, let's say, amplitude has been transferred from this uh, air peak to the quasi-particle peak, uh, and how much amplitude uh, is eventually in other peaks like satellites. Okay, so how GW works? Well, this is, the, let's say, one of the plots that you can easily see when someone wants to give uh, advertise, uh, let's say, GW. This uh, plot is taken uh, from this paper, so it's now uh, pretty old. And it is showing the, the quasi-particle gap uh, of many materials comp computed within GW and compared with the DFT, which, uh, as we know, underestimated the gap, uh, and that's the fourth width which overestimates the gap. Uh, well, this is one of the say, main achievements of GW, but of course now you know you can, uh, let's say, get similar results also with uh, IDITS, uh, uh, Kupman functionals and other approaches. But with GW, you can do even more. So one of the points is that you don't get just the band gap correct, but also the, the bandwidth. And this is shown in uh, this picture. So this is a comparison uh, we were looking at this before between uh, DFT and GW bands. So DFT in black and GW in violet. So you see that here the top of the valence band is aligned in between the two, but then the dispersion of the bandwidth of GW is much bigger. And then if we take this portion, uh, we can go, and this is what is uh, shown here in the zoom. This compared with experimental data and the dispersion from GW is uh, very nicely reproducing uh, the dispersion measured experimentally with ARPES. The material is uh, HBN. So this is one of the points. Uh, and then uh, what we, we discussed uh, that we gain uh, is that we have something frequency dependent. Uh, and in principle, we are able to discuss to, to capture satellites. So here on the left uh, is again taken uh, by this uh, pretty old paper. You see the photo emission spectrum of uh, sodium. This is the quasi-particle peak. And these two, which are uh, rather big, are plasmonic replica. And below, you see what you can get uh, with GW. So the first one, the dashed line, is what is uh, the GW from the Dyson equation. And here you already see that GW has a satellite, but in the wrong position is in between the two satellites. And indeed, this uh, GW satellite is what is called plasmalon. And uh, let's say somehow gives the wrong physics because you are plugging in. Uh, one of the reasons is that you are taking an approximated self energy and putting it in the Dyson equation, and this is the result. So, what has been done in the literature already in this paper, and then more recently also in this paper is to still use the GW self-energy, but it, to insert it uh, in what is called uh, the cumulant expansion. So this GW cumulant uh, is this black line uh, and reproduces uh, nicely the two plasmonic replica of sodium. And the same approach uh, is used here in this paper to describe the photoemission of silicon. So the experimental data are the dots. And then you have again GW, which nicely reproduces the quasi-particle part of the spectrum, but which has the wrong uh, satellite. And then there is the GW plus cumulant, which instead is able uh, to correctly reproduce uh, the quasi-particle peak. So one remark is that uh, if instead of using the full Dyson equation, we linearize the Dyson equation, this is able to give uh, correctly the first satellite. And uh, I mean, one of the reasons is that this is indeed just uh, this cumulant expansion. You see, you have an exponential. If you truncate, uh, imagine this exponential is a sum over n, and you truncate for, to first order, and the two are the same. This is a representation of the satellites, uh, the plasma satellites in silicon taken from uh, this other paper. And what they do is, uh, they don't show just the, say, K-integrated spectrum, but also the K-resolved one. 
And again, they show that uh, GW gives uh, these uh, wrong uh, plasma ionic satellites, while instead the GW plus cumulant is the correct satellite. And they also show that this can uh, indeed be reproduced by a simple, uh, uh, let's say, plasma pole model. Because in the end, what you have is that you have the mass structure and you have a replica shifted by the, the, the plasma frequency. Now, this is about satellites. Instead, uh, what about the lifetimes? So in, the, in this plot, uh, which uh, you have seen, there is also a line width for the GW bands, GW plus uh, cumulant bands. And you see that going down in energy, the bandwidth increases uh, a lot. And one of the reasons is that this uh, electron electron self energy GW has a, has a bandwidth which increases uh, quadratically with the energy moving away from the bottom of the conduction band or the top of the valence band. But instead, when you are nearby the, the top uh, of the valence band, for example, these uh, lifetimes are usually pretty small. And what instead is important is uh, to capture what is uh, plot here is uh, the effect of electron phonon. Here you see that the electron phonon lifetimes instead are in general uh, much bigger, close to the band edges, uh, and it is what determines uh, the, the bandwidth in the, in the quasi-particle spectrum. So you can compute the quasi-particle line with uh, using other self energies. And uh, this was the, the example of bike silicon. And this is another example where, which has been done in this paper for the case of molybdenum disulfide. So again, you see the effect of the GD, electron phonon self energy, on the bandwidth, you see that, uh, for example, at the top of the valence band, the width is very small and also pretty small at the bottom of the combustion band, although a bit bigger because there is this other valley nearby. While you study, when you move, uh, let's say, in a region where you have a high density of states, uh, the line width becomes bigger. So these are at the zero K, and you see these uh, plotted you know, with the dot dashed lines uh, are the spectral uh, functions uh, at these uh, selected points. At zero K, and then you see what happens when you increase the, the temperature. So with the electron phonon self energy, you have the change uh, of the spectral function, and then also the change of the line with uh, as a function of the temperature. Now, electron phonon gives you the the line with, uh, while the plasma gives the satellites. And um, so, why is it so? Can be also understood from uh, this plot. So here we are again uh, looking at the spectral function, the many body spectral function for uh, this case, uh, a model system where there is uh, in general a, a self energy, the green function times a boson. So it can be either a plasma or a phonon or whatever. And you see two different cases. So in one case, when uh, the boson has an energy similar to the Fermi energy of the system, uh, or even bigger, maybe that can be the case of the plasma. And in this case, you see that you have uh, the quasi particle peak plus a replica. While instead, when you have uh, your uh, boson which has an energy which is much smaller than the Fermi energy, you don't really get uh, a satellite, but rather what you can see are these kind of features in photoemission. So, compared to the bare band, there is a, what is called the kink in, uh, in the band structure. And this is what can be captured by phonons uh, and lines. So this is in a, in a model system. And here there is an example uh, instead in, uh, for, uh, in an actual calculation on, uh, on bulk iron. So this is a comparison of uh, the upper signal for bulk, from bulk iron and the computed uh, spectral function, again, with a G boson like self energy, this time is the GT, the thematic self energy, which in this case computes the, the it contains the manuals as peaks. And you see that the, the self energy is able, the use of the self energy is able to reproduce the, the key. So the experimental data here are uh, fitted and use the, 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 the pulse in the experimental signal obtained with the Laurentian fit and reported here and it is very nicely reproduced by the many-body spectral function. 
And this concludes a bit the, the an overview of what can be done in terms of uh, pulse uh, uh, line width or uh, eventual kinks with many body cell energy. And now for the second part of the talk. Uh, so how much time do I have? Okay. Last enough time. I would like to discuss uh, how many body perturbation theory can be used to compute accidents, so neutral excitations, and then the lifetimes uh, of accidents. So to get neutral excitations, what you can do is uh, just to switch from the one body unit function to this uh, or the two body unit function. This is called L, which is the expectation value of these uh, four field operators. Now, without going into details, uh, if you insert the completeness relation here, uh, and then you a sum, uh, then you have a sum in between uh, the ground state and the excited states, uh, which will have the same number of particles mm -hmm. uh, as the ground state, because I first destroy, I first create, and then destroy an electron. So the poles of these objects uh, are this time neutral excitations. And similarly to the green function, uh, I can define also for this object, uh, a Dyson-like equation, although this object is a function of four times uh, and it has a pretty involved structure uh, in uh, frequency space in Fourier transform. So there is a main frequency, which is, uh, say, T1 minus T3, uh, the time going from left to right, but then there are also the other frequencies due to the Fourier transform from T1 to T2 and T3 to T4. So in any case, uh, besides this, there is a... Uh, the equivalent of the self-energy, which is the kernel of this Dyson equation, which is actually the functional derivative of the self-energy. And what is done in practice in, the, in beta salpeter is to take the static uh, kernel and to take this uh, uh, Dyson equation with a static kernel. It can be reformulated into an eigenvalue problem. So this eigenvalue problem describes, uh, let's say, free electron uh, all excitation. So an electron promoted from the balance to the conduction uh, and the role of uh, this term, which is the derivative of the after term. And in the electronal uh, language is called the electron exchange term. And then this term, which is the derivative uh, of the GW self-energy, keeping W frozen, which is the electronal interaction. So one can solve this eigenvalue problem and get the excitonic wave functions uh, which can then, then be represented also in, uh, in real space. So they describe the bound electronal states. So this is a picture uh, which gives, uh, let's say, an overview of the GW plus beta salpeter scheme. So usually when you want to compute the absorption spectrum of the system, you start from DFT, you need to, to get the gap corrected uh, by the quasi-particle correction. And then when you solve the beta salpeter, you get some uh, bound peaks uh, in within uh, the quasi particle gap. And these peaks are the neutral expectations. So, just very quickly to, to tell you that this worked uh, very nicely in a number of materials. So, this is a bulk silicon. Here is bulk lithium fluoride. So, this is, uh, say, can be seen as a prototype of a material with the weakly bound excitons or funny uh, excitons. And here you see the independent particle or quasi-particle uh, uh, absorption spectrum, the black dashed line, and then the effect of the binding energy, which gives uh, a small shift compared to the quasi-particle gap. This peak is below the gap, and then an enhancement of the peak. And it is well described by this, uh, the experimental term by silicon. It also works nicely for a strongly bound exciton. So the, in lithium fluoride, the quasi-particle gap is here. 14.5 EV, and the exciton has roughly two electron volt of binding energy, and uh, the beta salpeter in orange is again able to, to get the first excitonic peak uh, and also the, the whole excitonic series. It also works well in uh, molybdenum disulfite, again, experiment versus beta salpeter or in a bulk layer material like uh, HPN. And what you can, uh, you can gain, you Besides this spectrum is that you can analyze, uh, so for example, here is a plot in your space of the excitonic wave function for lithium fluoride. So you can see that, for example, the first uh, exciton uh, has this kind of shape, fixing uh, the position of uh, the hole and plotting as a function of the position of electron. 
and this uh, look like looks like uh, the same uh, S state in uh, for the exciton. So the the electron is uh, moving around symmetrically around the hole. While this other exciton, for example, there is a node in the center where the hole is fixed and can be seen more as a P state. Then, of course, a, a more careful analysis has to be done looking at the point group of the material. So this for the lithium fluoride. This, for example, for monolayer HBN, where again you have the wave function in real space, and then you can also analyze the wave function in reciprocal space. And here you see that, for example, the first exciton is pretty much localized at the K point, the edges of the Lewin zone of HBN. Uh, let's say another uh, recent achievement, uh, uh, what you can obtain uh, within beta salpeter is to solve the beta salpeter at finite momentum. So this time you're not just describing uh, ex vertical excitation where the electron is, the electron is promoted from violence to conduction, but at finite momentum excitation where uh, the electron and the hole, they have a different momentum. And gi this gives you a dispersion for the excitonic peak. So this is the bound peak uh, of uh, molybdenum disulfide, and there is a dispersion. This is the dispersion of the dark exciton. And this is, you have the dispersion of the bright exciton. And what you can also get, similarly, for example, to the case of phonons, uh, that you have this uh, splitting of the branch into, this is what is uh, a tra the transverse branch of the exciton, and this is the longitudinal branch. So here, here we are in uh, 2D, so at uh, gamma there is no LT splitting, but at finite momentum there is a splitting uh, due to the longer range uh, interaction felt by the longitudinal branch. And it's taken from this uh, paper from the group of Stephen. Okay, then last part. So we have the, the excitons, and uh, we can describe them. And uh, now we can think uh, similar to the quasi-particle, can we define uh, lifetimes and uh, eventually satellites, satellites of excitonic peaks? So can we do, do we have a picture like this also for the excitonic case? And uh, this can be done. So one can start from the static uh, beta salpeter equation and somehow think about uh, a frequency dependent kernel, which can be a kernel, for example, describing the interaction of excitons with phonons, uh, excitons with plasmons, or other, uh, let's say, degrees of freedom. And then think that this uh, excitonic peak can become broad. Uh, and then, so this can be done in, uh, in this framework. So one usually solves uh, the leading order part, the say, quasi particle correction, and then the static kernel, and get, for example, an imaginary part for the peak from uh, a dynamical self energy. So I want to do a remark that uh, this idea is pretty different from what could be an alternative idea, thinking that uh, my electron and walls, now they have uh, a finite line width. And then I can think if I combine them in uh, forming an exciton, then this, uh, the line width of the quasi-particle can be somehow transferred uh, directly through the exciton through a static kernel because I already have some line left. So this idea was uh, used uh, in the literature. So the, one of the first attempts uh, to get from quasi-particle lifetime was in this direction. But it is not correct and it is not correct for, uh, let's say, two reasons. So the first reason is that uh, here you see that the line width is coming from evaluating the self-energy at the quasi-particle energy. But instead, what you should do more formally is to evaluate uh, the self-energy, or better, the kernel at the excitonic energy. So somehow here you are uh, evaluating the, the, the dynamical part at the, the wrong uh, say frequency as far as the exciton is concerned. And then the other uh, the other important point is that this kernel, which is the real self-energy of the exciton, contains also self-energy diagrams. So it is correct that also self-energy has an effect, but there are also other diagrams which need to be taken together. Otherwise, you somehow mess up the, with the descriptions of it. So the, let's say, work in this direction has, has been done, especially in the field of the exciton phonon kernels. This is uh, an expression 
is again similar to what we had for the self energy. So the self energy was the green function times a boson GD uh, for the phonon GW for the plasmon. And here again, I have something which is my initial particle L, the exciton, and then LV, the other boson. So this, but this time it is a kind of boson boson interaction. So this is how it looks like uh, if uh, it is written, uh, say, within uh, all the formalism of uh, ab initio many body perturbation theory. And in particular, we have, let's say, a conceptually simple part. There is, uh, let's say, my initial exciton can be transferred via exciton phone interaction to a finite, to a finite momentum exciton via the emission or absorption of the phone with this momentum. And then, and this is affected by the phonon populations and exciton populations, of course. And then I have what is the, say, the tricky part to be computed up initial, that is the, the matrix elements, which needs to contain both the exciton wave function and the electron phonon wave function. So this expression has been discussed in, uh, in a number of works, both for, uh, let's say, the first principle implementation or for, uh, let's say, more formal derivation. And in particular, these matrix elements uh, have this uh, form. So one, there are two terms, uh, and one can imagine that one term describes the initial exciton. This, uh, where the, the phonon is coupled through the hole, so the hole is, is scattered in the final exciton. And then another term where I have the initial, ex initial exciton, and then the phonon is coupled with the electron, which is then scattered in the final exciton. And then if you go through all these, you can get again a bus structure. This, this time is the exciton uh, dispersion. So it's not the one particle dispersion where you, you, just, you don't just have the energies, but also you have the, the lifetime of the exciton associated to every point in space. You can do that and you can also get uh, satellites. Uh, satellites uh, can be obtained, for example, uh, uh, solving this uh, equation with the dynamical kernel uh, and computing the, the photoluminescence. So this is uh, something which has been done again in a number of works. And here I'm showing the photoluminescence spectrum uh, of HBN, and in particular of, uh, let's say, of 2D boron nitride in the hexagonal HBN and in this, uh, uh, what is called R form of uh, boron nitride. And uh, okay, well, one of the nice things is that uh, depending on the shape of the spectrum, it is possible to distinguish uh, between these two polyphors, polymorphism of boron nitride, uh, which is uh, something which is difficult to do. But uh, I mean, let's focus, for example, on uh, boron nitride and let's see what, what we are looking to here, into here. So boron nitride has this uh, excitonic dispersion. And then there is a direct peak, which is from the ground state uh, to this uh, gamma point, so the zero momentum exciton, which can be, for example, seen in absorption. And that would be this direct peak. Now, what we are looking at here instead are the satellites, and uh, these are the, the emission of uh, photons, uh, not from directly from this peak, but from uh, this valley. And this emission has to be mediated by different phonons. And depending on uh, which phonon energy is taken into account, uh, then I have different replicas. And here I, I see basically only the satellite because this is a photoluminescence, so see the axis on the emission. And uh, I can imagine that if my material is at low temperature, only these states are occupied while this state is empty. So ju I just have the gas of excitons in this valley. I can just see the signal that from the satellite. And uh, so one last remark. Uh, on this, so we have uh, seen that we can compute this uh, lifetime of the exciton, similarly to the case of the self-energy, which is the imaginary part of uh, the exciton phonon kernel evaluated uh, at the excitonic energy on the excitonic state. So a nice work uh, which came out uh, recently discussed the, the difference uh, in between, however, uh, having a lifetime for the exciton and the idea of uh, eventually plugging in this lifetime directly in the denominator of the absorption to get uh, the line width. And instead, what happens is uh, with uh, not only the diagonal of the kernel, but really 
the full kernel lambda lambda prime is taken into account. And this has something to do to the difference between uh, the lifetime of the exciton as a particle and instead of the line width, uh, which is uh, which appears uh, in the spectrum, which is instead related uh, to more the decay of the excitonic polarization, so you do a, a, a dephasing process. And what is shown indeed is that uh, also taking into account uh, the off diagonal elements, well, first of all, the expression uh, changes for the, the line width uh, of the dilated function. But in particular, what they show is that if this is the approach is compared to some experimental data, the let's say the full approach where also the diagram uh, matrix elements are taken into account, well describe the line width in the system, while the diagonal approach only underestimates the, the line width seen in something. And uh, yeah, I think with that, I can conclude, just skip the last slide. Thank you very much, Sally, for the excellent presentation of the, the broad theme. Uh, questions here. Um, thank you very much uh, for your talk, and then uh, I'll see you again on the other school uh, some months ago. So, I have a uh, few questions. Um, could you please bring up some of your First half of the lecture, um, when you compared some very initial results, um, and what are you doing while you're missing some satellite So the part on uh, in the first part, which is one or uh, okay, sure, I think it's good. So here we have um, one we put several peaks to the right, yep, and we have. One smaller, let's call it the satellite, the one in the middle of the picture. Yeah, and this this should be this one and also this one. Yeah, yeah two. let's say two satellites and three real peaks from the whole legacy. Um, how are first of all the three peaks fundamentally different from the two satellites, and what do those three peaks um, have in common? Why is there not two peaks and three satellites? And, uh, so what exactly is it that enables? So maybe uh, these, I mean, these uh, three peaks. Yes. They, I mean, they depend on the resolution, but they actually come from the quasi-particle band structure. So if you compute uh, GW just with quasi-particles, and then you do you integrate in k-space, uh, you just get these peaks, and you you don't get anything else here. Uh -huh. So the quasi-particle approximation just gives you this. Okay. Okay, I understand. So it's more or less where they come from. Yeah. Okay, and now this may be, let's see, I'm not sure if I, if I can phrase it correctly, but I remember from, from the Anders School, one of your colleagues saying that um, many particles is not many times one particle, so it's like different fundamentally yeah. than a few particles, I'd say. But I was thinking, uh, what do you have to, what time? trying to apply this to, is it possible to um, say, I have I have a very long but thin supercell from a material on it. Well, would it be possible to, let's say, split it into smaller chunks, like a running window? And if I, if well, given that I finish my DFD calculations for the whole thing, just run GW on those moving window, on this moving window, and trying to obtain the properties of the, the middle part of it. Um, because it scales for it, I mean, for it, it scales, it, it has a different scaling with the system size. Yeah. And I, I'm trying to see if I, once I build up my DFT, is it possible to split it into smaller chunks? So uh, I would say that in general you could try. It depends on how much the electrons are delocalized. One uh, one point. So if you have electrons which are delocalized in the whole supercell, I would say that uh, then you should take the just a smaller chunk. You so the... if I were to focus on a state where they're more or less localized, at... then if you focus on a state which is more or less localized, then I think you can get something, and then you what you miss is the interaction of that state with everything else. So... Yeah. 
and you will miss something and then uh, how good is it this would be i don't know so perhaps if we could just try and see if it interacts long range it doesn't work if it interacts yeah. long range it's not going to work i can add on this uh, uh if you are talking about uh, so uh um, whether or not we can sleep the, our system uh, or separate a system within the uh, in cases with the molecular soil, because the molecule is so and so on, that typically for the W expect a worse behavior with respect to the FT, because the FT uh, for the worse within the solution of the F is more. Local, so for instance, uh, even if you don't have direct identification of the states of your object in the environment, see the value of suffer of uh, missing polarizability from the environment. Still, then there are models, so you can make models where you small embed this uh, polarizability. Then, if you go to a system that is very uniformly covalent, then you just want to take snapshot, then I, I, I there are probably attempts eh, to do that, but to me, that would be difficult and a bit more safe to be out of Right, there are, can make a comment, but there are probably now spinning potential, such as one band, which is probably one band, but it's like to get things that are not really organized, like the basic steps to be organized. Then you can give it like a spin down, and the idea that I'm going to score is a bit in our sort of. Yeah, there are many steps. Oh, I just wanted to make a comment to your first question about the difference between, and uh, also question, the satellite and the polyparticle peaks. Is it correct to say that polyparticle peaks somehow retain the independent character of the particle, but the rest of the, the interaction while the satellites, this, the independent particle place is a collective solution. Is it correct? But to, to distinguish the mathematical feature that you have in that figure that you were talking about. Uh, so it is incorrect. So satellites is uh, you lose completely any idea of particle that you have an oscillation is a non oscillation. For example, in the mystery critics are still somehow remembering. An independent idea of particle, but there is a problem with the interaction. Is this correct? Because otherwise, yeah. So I, I would say that, first of all, I mean, if you take this picture, I would say that there is a no really strict or formal way to distinguish this peak from this other one. If not, that this one is much higher in intensity. And then if I take the integral, Below this peak, it takes most uh, of the spectrum. Uh, okay. No, first of all, someone who's recognized this mathematical feature and map up. Well, like a sort of beyond this, you mean? Yeah. I mean, this, that's the cartoon. So, what, what, you, what usually is said is that uh, if the area below this peak, uh, which is uh, basically Z, uh, is above a threshold, you, know, you can fix 0 0.7, 0 0.8, the maximum is 1. Then you have a well-defined quasi-particle peak uh, and the satellite. But there can be cases, uh, usually the prototype are strongly correlated material, where you take the your, let's say, initial peak, uh, and then it splits in two peaks, which are out and out. And then uh, you cannot say anymore there is uh, the main peak and the satellite. Mm. It's just that the quasi-particle peak picture is breaking down. Perhaps, uh, so, uh, understand your question, a possible way to recognize is that uh, the big peak uh, is a particle very normalized by plasmonic interaction, plasmonic screening. The other one is the leftover, where really you have uh, uh, the particle and uh, so you excite the plasma with the satellite. And somehow, so the satellite is the leftover. So there, the, uh, you have a, a lot more the effect of the satellite. So somehow, here you have just a particle and a bit of interaction with the plasma, and there you have uh, the particle and uh, the, the, you have two excitations uh, in the in the satellite. But the word, uh, yeah, I think I mean once you can identify yeah a main peak, 
And then yeah, the current is that. But the data continues, right? So that the I mean, I guess what Andre is saying that you can forget that it exists. I mean, you, you can just look at the many body grid function. It doesn't matter where you get it, it is independent of the final result of the starting point. And then, if it's uh, if you can call one peak quasi particle and the other not, it just depends on, yeah, on the shape. Yeah, so in the Google expansion, you have this equation uh, in the center. We have exponential, yeah. the I, C, and the prime, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so if you put this exponential to one, you don't have satellite, like the three positive particles. Exactly. But then this exponential, if you put exponential, you get satellites. Yep. And but then is, I, yeah. I'm not expert in this, but I would tend to agree with the uh, uh, interpretation of Andrea that uh, satellites could be seen as a collective. Yeah, yeah, but, so but I mean, you've seen uh, this for particles. So I think here all works uh, if you remember. I mean, if, if you have a starting point uh, to begin with, where we have a quasi particle. Yeah. So this, uh, so to begin with, you identify that there is a peak, this one for sodium, and this one which is a quasi particle, and then on top of that you can. Uh, otherwise, uh, also formally, the cumulant comes as an accurate solution that from both on. Problems, so somehow you have the right thing, you have the particles in both. So I think that can be said. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's exactly right. Yeah. It's the exact solution. Yeah, it's the same. 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 So yeah, it's true that here you have some charged excitations coupling with uh, neutral excitation. But then if you think to the case of uh, neutral excitation, you have a neutral excitation coupling to another neutral excitation. And there it becomes uh, even more difficult to distinguish. Yeah. 
very quick technical question. So now we have three these three weeks which are I would say overlapping with one another in the basis. Well the red lines. How difficult is, is it to uh, let's say differentiate their contributions while you want if you want to examine their uh, lifetime so uh, so you mean these three picks? Yes. Ah, well, what you can do, I mean, because this is just a, a plot where you integrated the uh, over k, and uh, then it, this is what you get. But uh, uh -huh. from the simulation, you you really get everything, so you can look at the k points you would like to. So for every point, there is a line width. So you can disentangle dis really everything. Yeah. Uh, Yes. So the number of uh, particle peaks depends on the lifetime. Is the number of condition peaks, uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. really run to that if you to know what those peaks are. No, no. The I mean, typically when you you do GW on a material which is <laughs> where the quasi particle approximation is good. The number of peaks you get in GW is just the number of Koneshan peaks you have from the FT. So it's just, it's really. I mean, it's really that you solve this equation. So for every Koneshan state, there is a, a shifted peak, and the shift is just this expression. And so earlier on, you were mentioning uh, a situation where you have the white peaks and the. And the satellite and the yeah. I mean, this is the I, I don't have the picture here, but it is the typical cartoon which is shown to describe uh, what are called the strongly correlated materials. So you take the system without any interaction and have a, a well defined peak, the function peak. Then you switch off the interaction and you see that this peak is splitting in two. And depending on the, inter the strength of the interaction, uh, it can be at the beginning you have a peak with maybe two small satellites. At the end, the quasi particle peak is completely suppressed, and you just have what where the satellites have small interaction. The other yeah, the, upper, the two other bands, exactly. Yeah, that's the cartoon. But then, sorry, then you lose the strong Yeah, this the, the quasi particle picture breaks down, and all this uh, breaks down. I mean. You, you cannot do that anymore. Well, first of all, the GW self-energy will not work anymore. But somehow, if you think you start from this uh, exact equation, then you, you have to go beyond uh, well, at least this approximation, but then... Uh, what does the Lutinger principle? The Lutinger principle, I think, yeah, doesn't problem. I think so. There's no single type of reference to the uh, Yeah, that's the cartoon. Then, yeah. And this is where, uh, I mean, the people doing dynamical mean field theory, they say, they claim that this is where they, they are able to. Is that the form dynamical That is also taken as a definition of strongly correlated. Exactly. Yeah. The particle picture of all its your medium of the life. Yeah, um, I don't know about that. So I have a small question. What are these quasi particles? What do you mean by quasi particles in the first part? So I understand exotons are what are these exotons, or then you say. I mean, the, the name, uh, let's say quasi particle, it really comes from this, uh, this cartoon that a particle is something which is, uh, let's say, uh, which lives forever. Yeah. Instead, of the quasi particle is a, an excitation of uh, the system, which, although has a finite uh, lifetime, so it's not exactly a particle. Uh, no, but I mean, like, is it like exciton? No, no, no. It's really you. You can think about having the electron dressed by the the, the mean field, the interaction with the surrounding electrons. It's a, it's a, again an electron. It's just that it has a finite lifetime. Okay, because um, so this similar types of peaks, if you look into the um, cluster dynamics, this is just so they come because of the uh, dummy states that are uh, formed 
as we explained the uh, details, and they form like the satellites that like do up all the satellites in the uh, details. Yeah. So I don't know whether this is related to that. Or not. So that's why I said I'm not really sure whether they are the same. But that's because our project part. Exit on the quasi-particle. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, the quasi-particle world can you can be used in a broad sense, and then it includes excitons, uh, and these quasi-particles, or in a more strict way, if you want, which is uh, the quasi-particles serve uh, as the poles uh, of the green function, in this case, uh, the quasi-particle. Yeah, it's a second, uh, more than a question, because I thought it was answer. Yeah, yeah, you, you can refer to the exciton as a quasi particle yeah. again, and, and I'm perfectly fine. It really depends uh, on the meaning you want to give you. Oh, uh, sorry, that was not my question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for the, uh, this uh, the third that we talked about, which is the exciton like time actually. So, um, so, do you actually see the excited states? Do you see the relaxation in the excited states? <laughs> well, so, like, you know, so, can we do uh, so for example in the picture just one before? No, in the uh, no, 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 before. Before? No. I don't know. Yeah, last Let's see. It's so here or uh, no, I mean like just on account of the band structure, so there were like some excited uh, so due to the excitations to the higher excited states, and can we actually see DK uh, or analyze the DK from one? I mean, in the excited states. I mean, so let me just. I mean, in a sense, what you compute here is the lifetime of an exciton. In the same sense, uh, the. Is it in a real approach? Or use uh, the, the exciton? This is the, the lifetime of the exciton. I mean, you're not following the dynamics. This is the lifetime of an exciton, which ideally would have, if you take the exciton in this person. You decide I put my existing state uh, precisely, I don't know, here in this point of the bus structure, and there is just this exciton. Then the lifetime of this state uh, due to the interaction of the phone of the with the phonon uh, will be this, I think our uh, lifetimes in uh, picoseconds will be this, uh, I don't know, this color corresponds to 20 picoseconds. But then if you want to do dynamics, then uh, I mean it's a and then there is more, of course, if you want to do dynamics, you can just do I don't know, some kind of Boltzmann equation, for example, for the excitons. You can use this expression and plug them in, and then you get some scattering processes. And um, okay, then because I thought that we follow some, like, for example, in um, if you want them to actually follow the excited state, you can follow them quickly and then like somewhat analogous to this. And uh, is it possible to do this for, let's say, clusters? I mean, people uh, are, no, no, people are trying to do uh, say, some kind of real time propagation. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. The, there are different approaches. You can try Boltzmann, you can try the non equilibrium wave functions. Uh, so there are different things. Yes. Are there any other questions? So if not, uh, but then...